if you do any prospecting with LinkedIn, you have got to go get set up with Surf. That's S U R F E. It's a tool you can use to add new contacts to your CRM system directly from LinkedIn in seconds. I'm using it every single day. I add contacts, follow my deals, keep track of notes, and it ends up saving me a bunch of time on prospecting and outreach, which means I can spend more time moving my deals along. The data is always 100% accurate since I don't have to copy and paste all the fields over from each and every contact that I want to put in my CRM. Instead, Surf does that all automatically with just one click in about 60 seconds. The team over at Surf has put together a very special offer for fans of sales players. There's a link down in the show notes and you can use the promo code JWSurf5. Don't forget the E at the end of Surf. That's JWSurf5 for 5% off your first year. Don't spend another minute doing things manually. Go get set up with Surf. Today's episode is an interview with Jason Cutter. Jason owns Cutter Consulting Group and is the author of Selling with Authentic Persuasion, Transform from Order Taker to Quota Breaker. And he and I shared a really great conversation. He actually started his career as a marine biologist and worked his way into sales. From that early sales experience, he's built a framework and process around being more authentic in your selling. And he's taken that and he now consults sales teams around the globe with how to create great scripts, how to be authentic, and how to ultimately get more pipeline and customers. So with that, uh, welcome Jason to the SaaS Sales Players. Hey Jason, welcome. Thanks for having me, Jesse. I'm super excited to be here. Of course, of course. We're glad to have you and, and uh, glad to get this, this episode on the books. So tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get started in sales? I was doing some research before the show. Uh, I can't say that I've <laughs> met too many marine biologists who've transitioned into sales coaching and, and persuasion and the art of sales and things like that. So tell us about your background. How did you land in this crazy business? Well, you, you stole my punchline because normally when I speak and I talk to groups, I tell them, you know, I'm a, I'm a consultant, an author, a podcast host, trainer, professional speaker. And I took the path that most of us take, which is to getting a degree in marine biology and tagging sharks for years, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is always funny to think about. and makes no sense. And very few people do that. Um, you know, for me, here's the interesting thing is I chose marine biology because I was interested in sharks. I chose sharks as the best career path and something that seemed safer and better to do than dealing with people, which is a reflection of my childhood. So there's some people out there that I've had on my own podcast and I've talked to where they knew at an early age, they loved selling to people. They wanted to go into sales. They like people. They enjoyed people. Uh, I had the opposite childhood where I was, you know, a late blooming only child who was left out and bullied and picked on. Wow. And uh, I didn't fit in anywhere. And long story, but the short version is I wasn't a real fan of people growing up. Um, I was, I was kind of like, I liked people, but it, it wasn't mm -hmm. a good fit for me. So literally as yeah. I got older, I was like, I'm going to choose marine biology. The challenge with marine biology and tagging sharks, which is super fun, is that everyone wants to do that. And so I literally couldn't get a job in that. Uh, and then life took me on a couple of paths. And then at the age of 27, I got my first sales job in the mortgage business in 2002. And it was pure order taking. Everyone wanted to buy a house. I didn't even realize it was sales. I didn't realize years until years later what sales meant or what it involved because literally you know, you, you, you could accidentally close deals and make a lot of money at that point. And uh, mm -hmm. that kind of started me on this path that I've actually run away from many times as well. <laughs> I was sort of the same way when I first was, when someone first suggested that I consider sales as a profession, I, you know, just had a negative uh, preconceived notion about what it meant to be in sales. And one of the things that I, I'm glad to see is that that stigma is is somewhat going away, and that you know the world thinks of of selling as an art and a science and something that's worth pursuing. Uh, I can say, you know, from a financial standpoint, to your point earlier, 
it's very worth pursuing. Uh, but it's also just a great skill, that life skill. I mean, it has so many applications and use cases that, uh, yeah, I think it's it's great. The other thing I'm I'm glad to hear is it sounds like uh, you know in, in the spectrum you're more of an introverted. Uh, individual, which is great because I think some of the best sellers, and from my opinion, you know, from my perspective, some of the best sellers that I've worked with were were introverts, believe it or not. And I think that's that's a whole notion that people have as well. You got to be the you know homecoming king or queen, and that's how you get into sales. Is you were the popular person in school, and you're very persuasive, and probably an athlete, those kind of things. And I think those things can help in you know for certain types of sales. But I've also seen some, you know, more introverted and, uh, you know, creative folks really succeed in this profession, which is really awesome. Well, and I think what's interesting, because when you look at that, let's say that stereotypical all-star high school person that gets into sales, I see them having some success in sales, usually based on charisma and trying to use mm -hmm. that card over and over again of what they did in the past. Right. Not generally great at long term sales, maybe not at relational sales, not at like, you know, long term success. They're 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 hitting some home runs, but like how consistent. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think there is a lot of value in what you're saying. You know, one of the biggest things that I talk about a lot and do training on is that there's no I think there's no natural born salesperson. I think there's people who have some characteristics and some behaviors and personality traits that help in sales that they leverage and that they just go all in. Um, but I think anyone can make themselves into a sales professional. And there's some traits that, that they would all have in common uh, that don't revolve around extroversion, uh, charisma, storytelling, like all of those things yeah. uh, where anybody can be successful. For me, and this is a, a cool term I found years ago, is ambivert. So there's extrovert, there's mm. introvert, and then there's ambivert, which is like ambidextrous. It's kind of situational, sometimes extroverted. Like I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago. People would look at me when I'm training, when I go into a company, people look at me and like, dude, you're an extrovert. You love people. Like right. mm, sometimes. sometimes. And then <laughs> like, how do I recharge? Like I'm happy going to a conference, networking, you know, my face off and then literally going back to my room and not going to any dinners or events afterwards because I'm also okay with that. Um, <laughs> and I think that's important. I think the other part, not just introvert and extrovert is there's a lot of people like myself who are analytical like mm -hmm. my default mode is analytical science, spreadsheets, data, right? That's why I went into science and marine biology. And a right. lot of people think, well, you can't be good in sales if you're analytical. I think when you know how to harness that to benefit the potential customer and help them make the right decision instead of just the opposite end of the spectrum, which is stories and charisma and happy hours to close the deals, but actually helping yeah. them with some factual basis that benefits everybody, that is a very powerful salesperson. I, that that's a great point. And I, I think that the, the analytical side, the data driven side, coupled with someone who's creative as well, who can put together visual uh, examples of, of sort of the, the final state or the desired state. I think those are all very, very powerful qualities in, you know, in a top seller. Yes. So tell me about the, your first sales job. And, you know, you've, you've transitioned into it from a totally different career. And a lot of my listeners are, you know, currently transitioning into software or technology from another profession. What things did you do early on that helped put you on the right path, uh, having switched over from a completely different profession and likely a different mindset? Uh, what are some of the, the key things that, that you started implementing to, to find early success in sales? I want to say nothing and that I sucked and I didn't know anything. Uh, that, that, that's my first. I mean, you know, cause like I said, it was mortgage business was hot. Everyone wanted to buy a house. The running joke with everybody in the industry was uh, if you answer your phone every once in a while and don't ever call anyone back, you'll make six figures, right? Like it was wow. just so popular. You didn't have to learn. I didn't learn anything about sales. I still screwed up a lot of deals because I realized I was doing things wrong and giving people too many options, which is a big lesson I learned. Um, but I didn't learn anything about sales. I, to this day, you, being in companies, various companies, I have received zero minutes of sales training. Really? At a company. I have never been hired into a company where they said, all right, we're going to put you through training. 
here's the mm -hmm. script, here's some, here's how to handle objections, here's what the buyers want, here's how to deal with personalities and behaviors, here's how to move someone through. No, like after my wow. first couple of sales jobs, I was hired into organizations and they figured I knew everything. And then I was <laughs> the one building all of it. So I had to learn it all. The biggest things I learned early on when I went from mortgage to helping people who are actually in foreclosure, which took a lot of persuasion, despite how you think it might be, um, is learning to ask lots of questions and then provide the solution that would fit them completely independent of what I may want or need. Right. Like we were talking about uh, right before we hit recording. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. you know, quarters come to an end, months come to an end. Everyone's got their motivation. Salespeople, if they're not careful, they're motivated by that. And it's like, hey, how do I get this deal done? Right. Independent right. of if it's actually a good thing for you to buy, I got numbers to hit. I want to keep my job or make some money. And so what I learned early on was it, uh, make, helping someone buy, if it's the wrong deal, it's never mm -hmm. going to work out, right? Instead, how do I ask enough questions to determine, do you have a square peg problem and I have a square peg hole that I can help you with? Or right. what's something else you should do and trust that there's enough people or companies on the planet? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good take. I think I spent a lot of my early career trying to jam round pegs into square holes and just, you know, lack of alignment around what, what a real opportunity was. And to your point, as you sort of build up your ability to do solid discovery and ask good questions, and, and it's not even just like following a template for that. It's really trying to understand the business uh, and being able to understand where there's value and alignment. And it takes, it takes time to do this too. It's not something that I don't, I don't believe I mastered this in my first or even second or possibly even third sales job. Uh, it, and, you know, and I'm still learning today. You know, I still uh, am learning how to be better at discovery and ask better questions and, you know, get better insights into the, the, the clients I'm selling to. So that's a really, really great point. Um, well, and I think um, one of the big things too that I've learned, and I work with a lot of companies, a lot of clients, a lot of individual salespeople is somebody gets a job at a company right? And especially if you're talking some of your audiences, people who are new-ish to sales, is mm -hmm. you get that job, you get excited, you get some training, hopefully some training. Uh, it's generally not very much, but hopefully you get some training. They tell you how great the product is or the services that you're selling, how everyone's going to want it, how you guys are going to be the next big thing, especially if we're talking like, you know, SaaS sales. Like I've been enough mm -hmm. in a, enough of those companies and around enough of those people where everyone thinks they're selling the next great miracle solution that's going to go yep. IPO. And then they're all going to be, you know, billionaires. Um, despite the fact that the world might not need an 18th CRM that they're not even using <laughs> the first one of. Right. Um, yeah. And so you work for a company, you excited, they tell you how great it is. And then you just assume that everyone will want this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, here's what it does. Of course, you're going to want to do this. And a lot of salespeople and sellers don't connect the dots to the true impact that the buyer could have if they buy or don't buy, right? Like right. what is the real value? Not just the, what were we told in training and, and what happened when we drank the Kool-Aid and how great we are and what the brochure says and my slide deck says, but like, mm -hmm. what does this really mean to that end user? And that's where I'm very thankful for the experience I had helping people in foreclosure early on is it was very clear. If I was effective at persuading them to let me help them, even though mm -hmm. they were like, it should be easy, but their head was stuck in the sand and they're just hoping something would work out. If I was yeah. effective, they had a chance of keeping their home. If I was ineffective huh. at basically selling them and persuading them, the sheriff was coming at 10 AM and kicking them and their stuff out. It's very wow. clear. It's winning and losing, right? When you're selling a SaaS platform or service, if it does any value, if it is of any value to the customer, mm -hmm. then if they buy it, it will help them get here. If they don't buy it, there's the potential that they'll go in a, a worse direction. And when you sell from that place, like I just want to help you and here's why, then mm -hmm. it totally changes the conversation. How did you how did you uncover that ability and, and maybe use the mortgage or sorry, the foreclosures as an example, how, how did you get to that point where you were able to, to your point earlier, persuade somebody to be helped. And I think in the, in the context of software, that would be persuading somebody to 
open up on what the in-state should look like and what the potential impact would actually be. It's a pretty delicate skill. I, from my you know, own experience and from talking to colleagues, it's not, not easy to develop that ability to, to sort of get that door open and go well beyond, again, like the, the deck or some of the high-level pitch resources. So how did you develop that skill and maybe walk us through an example of how that worked in the foreclosure example? Yeah. And, and here's what's interesting. And, and I love about this, Jesse, is that it applies to everything. I mean, I've sold lots of different things. I've helped clients in lots of different areas and it's the same things. You might think, okay, well, it's a homeowner over here who's in trouble. Uh, this is a, you know, a marketing manager who I'm trying to sell some marketing automation software to. It's like two different people. They're all yeah. still humans. They're all still people. Your, your, your B2B buyer is still a person with their own fears and challenges and worries about their job, their life, whatever they have going on. Um, you know, the biggest thing is setting the expectation that I'm there to help. Mm -hmm. The second thing is setting the expectation that if I can help, I'll let them know. If I can't, I'll let them know. And I do that no matter what, right? A lot of salespeople just, again, this goes back to, if I'm talking to you, I'm going to sell you and I'm going to figure it out versus if I can help you, I will, right? And I'll tell right. you what I can do. If I can't help you, I'll tell you that as well. And I'll give you some ideas and just setting that expectation. Mm. The one thing I tell lots of salespeople is when in doubt, just do the opposite of what you think you're supposed to do as a salesperson, right? <laughs> a lot of people think, what, what is sales? What am I supposed to do? If you just actually defy what you think you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to push or what you're supposed to do to close deals, that, that usually will help because your buyer, the consumer, anybody is expecting a salesperson to have their guards up against a salesperson. Mm -hmm. And when you show them that you're not the typical salesperson, you will win and get a lot further. So the first thing is setting expectations. And then literally the next part, it's so important, is just asking lots of questions. And here's mm -hmm. the thing that's the same with people in foreclosure, people who are in credit card debt, people who are in that job that you're trying to you know, get them to buy the software. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody has to know that, what you're selling or what you're hoping to persuade them to buy, if it's a good fit, right? This is the big caveat. It's got to be the yeah. right fit first. Is yeah. that that is the safest and best way to go. Our primal part of our brain that's been around with us for millions of years is still the amygdala, is still stuck in this the survival mode all the time and worrying about making a mistake that could kill us or making a mistake that could get us kicked out of the tribe of humans. We've survived <laughs> and thrived as, as a species. We've dominated this planet for good and for bad yeah. because we've stuck together as a group. If you did something wrong a long time ago, or even not that long ago, and the tribe mm -hmm. got mad, they banished you, you die. Like You're not going to make right. it on your own. Most people aren't. So yeah. our brain is worried about that. That's why most people, their number one fear is public speaking above death, right? I heard recently yeah. that people would rather be in the casket than speaking at the eulogy, right? Because that is crazy. it's crazy. And yeah. it's scary, wow. right? And why is that scary? Well, because if you mess up and they make fun of you or they pick on you or you get embarrassed, that part of our brain feels like, oh, I'm going to get shunned and kicked out mm -hmm. and ostracized. And so wow. the same thing with your buyers. Your buyers are humans. We're all human. We all have that, right? Um, and so your buyers are worried about that as well. So your number one job is to make them feel like what you can help them with, what you can help them buy is the safest and best option. That's your one job, right? Is they have to know that it's safe. Typically what happens, and some people sell with fear, some people sell with hope, right? You know, depending on what school of thought they're in or, or what's going on. The biggest challenge you're up against is that for a lot of people, potential buyers, what they're doing now is known and the known mm -hmm. is safe, right? It's right. safer for them to do nothing, even if they're on a bad path, than to pick a new path that could be worse. So a lot of it, especially long sales cycle stuff, right? Whether it's emotional people in foreclosure or it's you know B2B, is you've got to get to the root of what somebody wants and needs and then you've got to help them see that the path they're on right now is not the best path for them. Now, some mm -hmm. people go total fear mongering and make it sound really bad. And right. you could do okay, but usually what happens is after they sign up, they're just going to cancel anyway because the effect mm -hmm. wears off. But they have to show them that the path they're on right now is not going to get them where they want to be. And then this other path is safe and secure, and it's going to be the best way to go. 
And sometimes what that means is you actually have to deselect every other option they're thinking about and help them deselect those things so that there's only one option left. Like you have to help them remove all the, all the, all the other options off the table until there's just one. There's only one option. It's this, it's the best one. There's nothing else. And if you can't get to that point, you don't have a sale because they will always think, oh, I should go with door number two mm -hmm. instead of your door number three. Can I just say, I'm really glad that we're discussing evolutionary biology and psychology on this episode. I need to have more former marine biologists on the, on the podcast, it sounds like. Um, I am such yeah. a nerd for sort of how the psychology of buying and, and of course the psychology of selling work. So I'm, I'm always just so interested in those kind of insights. And I just learned a thing or two that I hadn't really considered uh, about, you know, sort of tribal decision-making and things like that. I mean, there's a, so there's a couple of things people don't, might not want to believe me, but there's a book called Safe and I forget who the author is, and it wasn't written that long ago, and he did some research. There's still tribes right now, nomadic tribes on this planet, that if you're sick or coughing or crying or making noise, they will literally tie you to a tree and keep on going because oh, wow. you're going to bring the predators in that could try to kill them, right? Like we're not talking millions of years ago. We're talking about that part of our brain is still here. Uh, it also explains why some people literally won't change brands of paper towels right? The pandemic was a fun, interesting experience because a lot of people didn't have a choice, right? I can't get my bounty, so I've got to pick something else, but that sucks and it's dangerous because what if it's a bad decision? And you're talking about SaaS platforms, right? We're right. talking about a little more than paper towels and people still like literally won't change from paper towels. I, I'm totally guilty of that on the paper towel front. <laughs> That's another story. But yeah, you know, what, what I've seen in SaaS is it's tough to make that decision because in the minds of the buyer, it's like, look, my job's at stake. I'm a corporate buyer on behalf of a big enterprise. If we implement the wrong solution, the wrong software solution, and it eats up 18 months or more of our engineering or IT resources, then I'm going to get walked out. And so it is, it's very high stakes. And it is, to, you know, back to your, uh, your comment earlier about putting them on the right path and then helping them sort of deselect options. Uh, that's, that is very effective with, with business buyers, especially when you're selling software is you need to help, you know, help with that alignment by getting them on that path and eliminating other possibilities, but they've got to come to that conclusion that it's the best possible solution forward and then have that confidence so that if things, you know, God forbid do go sideways, they can, they can come back out of it. But that's a really, yeah, it's so interesting, such great points. Well, and, and that's the big thing that I teach everybody who's selling anything is that no matter what you're selling, that buyer has a, they have two things. There's two sales that happen. I'm not talking like I'm selling you or you're selling me after the sale is made, that buyer has to continue to persuade themselves that they made the right choice, right? right. Buyer's remorse hits us all either mm -hmm. the moment we walked out of that store and realized, damn it, I fell for those tricks again, <laughs> or a week later or a month later, right? And then the second yeah. part is, is that that buyer has to perpetually persuade everybody in their life that they made the right decision, right? Mm -hmm. And an example of that for anybody is if you've ever bought a car and you've ever been excited about that car and then you tell people about that car, there's always that one person be like, well, what did you pay for it? Oh yeah, you got ripped off. Like you paid too much, <laughs> right? And they just shit all over yep. your excitement. <laughs> and made you feel bad and now you feel embarrassed and now you literally won't tell anybody else about your new car because you don't right. want that to happen again. You're dealing oh, with man. a SaaS buyer who has internal, personal, a spouse, significant other they don't wanna look bad in front of and then a company. And so how do you make them feel safe? How do you get everybody involved so that this is the safest thing and it's the best thing. And if anything does go sideways, it's still a better path than where they're at right now. Yeah. I'm curious about uh, authentic persuader. So you have a, I understand you have a podcast called that or you used to uh, and correct yep. me here. And then did you write a book about the topic? Uh, I want to hear yep. how you sort of develop that framework. And I guess, you know, first tell us what it is and then tell us how you, how you were able to develop this, this framework, this model uh, for, for persuasion. So the book is selling with authentic persuasion transformed from order taker to quota breaker. The podcast is The Authentic Persuasion Show, uh, which is initially called The Sales Experience Podcast. And then when the book came out, I uh, rebranded the podcast. Uh, to me, 
this is the culmination of being a dude with a marine biology degree with zero minutes of sales training by any organization, completely self-taught, and then running organizations for years and seeing literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of salespeople come and go and what worked, what didn't work, independent of where we started the conversation, which is the natural born salesperson fallacy of like who can do it and who can't. Um, mm -hmm. But literally looking at like, what did it, what did I do to be successful? Then what did I teach like tons of other people to do? And then how did that work? Um, and it's really that combination, right? The authentic persuasion. And both of those words, it's interesting because as soon as the book came out, people want to debate me on authenticity and is that good or bad persuasion is not good and they like some people like influence instead of persuasion and some people don't like authenticity they like transparency instead of that and it's like we can interchange the words all we want like that's totally fine i'm okay with that it's really that that focus and here's the challenge mm -hmm. is that a lot of people in sales they want the persuasion they want the sales. They want the tactics. They come to me and say, hey, what's the question I can use to close more deals? How, how can I ask for the sale? Like, what's the best strategy and process? Like, how do I move someone forward? And that's great, except none of that matters unless you know why you're in sales. You know why you want to be effective. You know who you are and what your strengths are. Like we were talking about with the introversion, extroversion, analytical people. Like, unless you're authentic and true to you, your buyers are going to pick up on that. Like I've, I've watched a lot of fake and phony salespeople mm. trying to pretend to be sales, sales professionals and the buyers yeah. can detect it again. They might fall for it today, but they're going to cancel tomorrow and back out of the deal once the magic wears off. So the authenticity piece is, is so important. And what I tell people, it's like, if like, let's say me, if I suck at golf, right? You, my, my parents as a birthday present got me custom golf clubs. That's awesome. They're the right length. They're a great set of golf clubs. It doesn't matter, right? That's mm -hmm. like me giving someone who's not very, doesn't know anything about sales, all the best sales tactics and closing lines to use. If they don't have the foundation built, it doesn't matter. So that's kind of why I structured it that way. And then the persuasion pieces, a lot of this stuff, it's understanding what the buyer wants, what they're afraid of, how you, how you focus on that instead of just features, benefits, facts, yeah. figures, statistics, social proof, testimonials, and then where yeah. those things come in versus where most people want to do it, which is like, they just want to vomit a monologue when they first start talking to somebody and mm -hmm. people don't care about that right away. Yeah. So how do you implement some of this at scale across a whole team? It sounds like you come into sales teams, inside sales teams, contact centers. How does that process work? And, and yeah, how does this sort of scale across multiple different personalities and, and selling personas and things like that? What's your strategy there? Well, the biggest thing is I am, and this will trigger some of the people in the audience listening to this. I am a big <laughs> fan of scripts. Right. Okay. Um, and again, most people are like, oh, you can't do that. And salespeople got to just say whatever. And it's a conversation. They just got to go with the flow, uh, especially for someone who's new. They need some scripts. They need some outline. They need structure, especially what they need is the transitions between one section of the conversation to the next, which is where most salespeople fall flat and end up to be order takers. Uh, when organizations bring me in, first thing we do is we'll do a gap analysis and look at, okay, where are you now? Where do you want to be when it comes to production, revenue, staff size? And then what's missing? What do we need to put in place? What do we need to do? And then fundamentally, here's the biggest thing is we still need salespeople. We still need people to have these conversations. Omnichannel, maybe text, email. You can't close deals over text and email. So it's either phone or video or in person. Like that's the way to make deals really happen. And so uh, as long as we're selling to humans, there will always be the need to have humans in a part of that. And then my goal with the company is how do we build everything around that? How do we give them systems, processes, structure? When it comes to scripts and yeah. the things that I teach and I focus on with the process is, okay, so you're gonna bring who you are. That's the authenticity piece, but here's the, here's the milestones. Here's the things you have to cover. Here's, here's your roadmap cover this, mm -hmm. then go to here and then go to here. And not in a like super granular, say these things. It's like, okay, you need to understand this process. And then mm -hmm. what needs to be built? How much can we automate? How much yeah. again, 
you're a human. I need you to be a human. I need you to talk to another human who's also scared and confused and get them to make a decision. That's what I need yeah. you for. Everything else around that is noise and busyness. Yeah. How can, how can a seller today effectively put together a script for themselves? You mentioned that you're, you know, you're a fan of scripts. I, I don't know if I have an opinion on it yet, but I've, okay. I've used scripts before. And then I've had managers say, you don't need a script. That doesn't sound authentic, but you're the authentic guy telling me that scripts can sound authentic. If I were in a, you know, if I were in my first sales job right now, how could I put together today a quick script that I could use on calls, on discovery calls in, you know, follow-up sessions that I have. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how you would put something like that together. Yeah. And I'll get there, but let me just address the script thing since you brought it up, which I love. Sure. So first off, um, everyone uses scripts, no matter mm -hmm. what. They might not have them written down, but if you're in sales or doing anything for any, even a short length of time, and you listen to your phone calls or watch your videos or recorded meetings, you will find that you end up saying the same thing over and over again. It's just mm -hmm. not written out and you're just not reading it. You've just kind of massaged it and defaulted to it. I listen to some really amazing salespeople and literally you take 10 of their phone calls. And if you line up the transcripts, they say the same thing at certain portions of the call. They have a script. It's just not written down. Yeah. That whole, like, you don't need a script. It's not authentic. In my experience, most of the time, that is a old school, classic charismatic storytelling, don't tell me what to do, just let me do what I do best salesperson who is in sales because that has gotten them that far. Maybe they weren't successful in anything else because they don't like structure, they don't like processes, they don't like rules. They just like mm -hmm. talking their way into and out of stuff, right? Interesting. Not saying that's bad. It's not sustainable long-term in my experience. And it's also not for everybody. And so the challenge is, is when you're a manager, and I think we might talk about this as well, but most mm -hmm. companies take their good sales rep, promote them to a manager and say, hey, you were good at sales, now manage. And then they just assume right. everyone else is great like them and everyone else can see the matrix like they did. And then mm -hmm. they think that nobody needs any tools. And that drives me absolutely crazy. I, I will go head to head against that philosophy all day long. Now, if you're like high turnover, you like losing lots of money, like burning through lots of leads, just, yeah, just keep it's hoping. Great, that it's great strategy. <laughs> Yeah, like that, that totally works. Like I see that all day. Um, yeah. But if you don't want to do that anymore, uh, then you have to give people some process. And I will say, here's a little caveat on scripts is, is when somebody's brand new, you just hired them, they have zero experience. Like that's a full on word for word script. Even if they're reading it and it sounds like a robot, that's better than them freestyling and screwing mm -hmm. it up all over your leads. Whether you're outbounding or inbounding, then it's, it's, it's painful. And just yeah. know, I come from the world of inbound, right? Especially direct mail. I spent a, long, a lot of time running call centers and, uh, where they were being fed by direct mail. Every mm -hmm. phone call is $55. Oh, so man. if I got some dude without a script, just winging it, and they blow 20 calls a day, that's $1,000 plus their base, plus the cost of their seat and the technology and the rent. Um, yeah, they have about lunchtime before we've got a serious problem, right? Um, wow. So so for me, that's the background I come in. So that's the thing with script. But when somebody's brand new, word for word, just read this, don't freestyle, don't screw it up, just follow this, and then you can get better. And then as somebody progresses, it's more bullet points, right? It's more checklist. It's more like cover these things just to make sure you don't forget anything important. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part were scripts and, and Victor Antonio said this really well. So I'm not going to take credit for this. Uh, and he's got a video out there. If you Google his, uh, his, uh, um, his response on scripting, which is amazing. I played this for salespeople a long time ago before just like talking about it myself is, have you ever been to a Broadway play? Have you ever watched a movie? That's a script. Those are all scripts. Yeah. Those are scripts. If you go to see Hamilton on Broadway, three times a day for the next three months, they don't wing it. They're not just like, hey, what are we going to do today in this Hamilton thing? I don't know. Don't give me a script, man. Just let me yeah. do my thing, man. Um, no. I'm a professional, yeah. <laughs> I'm a professional. Just let me do what I do best, man. Like, yeah. no, literally the same thing every time. That's my answer to scripts not being authentic. You can have a script that you read word for word and make it, and make it your own, but do it exactly the same way every time. 
-hmm. and still be authentic. So that that's how to crush all of that argument into oblivion. Um, And now if you're a salesperson, a seller, and you want to make your own script, here's the biggest things to focus on first. This is what I work with a lot of people and companies is write down and script out the monologues. There's two things. One is the monologues and one is the transitions. This is super Hmm. important. Whatever you're saying about your company or your product, the things where you're giving essentially a lecture about something, right? Right. Elevator pitch. Those are the things you want to have scripted and you want to say it over and over again. And then you want to adjust it, right? So you, you explain what your company does. And then based on the reaction, you do it a few times or enough times you go throughout the day, you're like, all right, that doesn't feel right. People don't really be, aren't vibing with it. Let me tweak Mm -hmm. a couple of things and keep testing just a little bit and then testing. But whatever you're going to do, like, here's how I explain the product. Here's how I explain this feature. Literally write out all of those things instead of winging it and write out, again, I call them the monologues where I'm talking at you. I don't care. I don't care what you say in response. Like I'm talking at you. Write yeah. all those down. Here's here's the contract. Here's the step where I'm going to send you the docu sign that you need to review. Literally mm-hmm. write all those things out instead of just winging it. Trust me. And then the other part is the transitions. And this is where a lot of people just literally suck at sales because they never have been taught how to transition and they get stuck, right? So they go through the rapport phase. They're building great rapport. And then right. the next part is they should be doing their discovery probing question asking process, right? And then they're like, okay, yeah, we're talking about sports. We're talking about weather. Okay, how do I get to this next part? How do I like, um, okay, so tell me about your company. It's like, okay, that that's weird. Like what happened? Yeah. Like uh, this, this, that was really weird. Um, and so that's a transition. When you go from one section of the conversation, the sales process to the next, that's a transition. Write those out and have that and then read it, memorize it and nail that, right? Mm -hmm. And a transition would look like, hey, I, you know, the next part here is what I wanna do to make the best of our time is I wanna ask you a bunch of questions. I wanna find out more of your company. I wanna see if it's a good fit. I wanna see if based on where you're at, if what I have and our company, if it's something that's valuable to you. And if it is, I'll let you know my recommendations. If it's not, I'll tell you that as well, right? Like I'm not here to just force you to do that. And so, you know, it's setting that expectation of what's coming up next, because again, going back to the evolutionary biology, we don't like surprises, right? We don't like mystery. We don't like the unknown. So every Mm -hmm. transition should be about, okay, in the next segment, we're going to do this and here's what's going to happen. And at the end of this segment, now good salespeople do that. Most people do that naturally. They set that expectation. They do the trial closes. They do all these fancy names for stuff. If you're new and building your own script, make sure you have those transitions. Because otherwise what happens is you go through the discovery phase and then you get like, okay, so I asked all my questions. Now, how do I get to the next step? Or I go through and I did my demo. Now, how do I get to the next step where I want them to actually buy? Or what does that look like? Um, Which again, makes people end up being more like order takers because they don't mm-hmm. know how to keep the thing going forward. Right. And they just hope the other person will know. Interesting. Oh, and that's so, that's so good. Um, yeah, I, I, and I, by the way, I love the title of the book too, and because order taking that transition from order taker to actual solution ear consultant is, is a big jump to make in a sales career. Uh, so cool. What, what do you see when you're working with clients? What are some of the biggest stumbling blocks that reps are making over the phone or, or even in person? I know a lot of people aren't selling in person in the, for the last 18, 20 months, but what are some of the big mistakes that you see uh, pop up consistently? I think beyond this, the... I don't know. I, I mean, it's kind of a combination of what we've talked about. I mean, most people yeah. don't have a process. Most people don't mm-hmm. have a system. Um, beyond what we talked about, to to not just reiterate what we discussed, I think the biggest challenge is that most people fundamentally feel that sales is gross. Yeah. Right. Most people, like I deal with a lot of people, and I just watch a lot of people. People. Mm-hmm 
don't like the idea of being sold. Now, some people say, I love being sold. Like I love it when somebody sells me and tries to sell me. Those people are weird and different and they just like confrontation and drama and they just want to battle somebody because they think it's a fun sport, right? Like a gladiator sport. Most Mm -hmm. everybody else does not enjoy that. Um, they, They don't like the thought of sales. Sales is a dirty word. Sales has a bad connotation and has for a long time, thanks to the people in sales, Uh, the movies, everything. I mean, sales is unregulated. Literally, Mm -hmm. literally at 27 (laughs) years old, my first day on the job was my boss saying, I sent out 10,000 postcards last week when the phone rings, fill out this lead sheet, put them on hold and then come get me. That was my first day training, right? (laughs) And I was just filling out lead sheets, but literally I'm helping people get in the largest debt of their life. And at the time in Washington state, there, it, you didn't even have to be licensed to be a mortgage loan officer. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's scary. Right? That and when you do that wrong or with the wrong intentions, and there's industries all over the place that aren't regulated, right? Um, mm-hmm. Where people can make a lot of money. And when somebody can make a lot of money and it's not regulated and there's no professional training or code of ethics or any oath that they have to take or governing body, then people will be out for themselves enough to turn everybody off. And if somebody doesn't believe me that the world thinks sales is gross, how many people listening to the show have the word sales in their title? Sometimes there's sales engineers, sometimes there's salespeople, but it's account executive. It's business development rep. It's, Mm -hmm. it's all these things to obscure the fact that they are a salesperson. Right. right? Because they're hiding it because the world thinks it's gross. So true. So so do you think one should embrace, embrace it or sort of run with that? Uh, you know, what's your take on, and you know, it may be split in hairs in some ways, but yeah, what's your, what's your take on how a new professional should position themselves? I, I think obviously you got to go with whatever your company gives you the title. Uh, I yeah. always believe, and this is why the authenticity piece has rung true with me for so long and, and why I have branded that because of how I've always done it, which is just to call call it what it is. I've always called it what it is. And really good salespeople do that as well, which is, Hey, I'm going to go through these questions and I'm going to tell you what I think. And my job is to, if it's a good fit, my job is to help you buy, right? That's what I'm here for. Uh, If it's not a good fit, I'll tell you, but if it is, I'm going to tell you why. And then I'm going to tell you why we should just move forward. Right. Mm -hmm. Just call it what it is. Let people know, like, if I think I can help you, I'm going to do it. That's it. Um, and I think that's important because then it alleviates that mystery of, I, is this person a salesperson? Are they going to try to sell me something? Like, let's just call it what it is. If I can help you, I will. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, I think that's important, but I think that's the biggest challenge, especially for new salespeople, especially for people in sales who are struggling is they don't realize they have to take the, um, they have to take the initiative themselves both to get their own coaching, their own training, a mentor, they have to build up their own skills. No company I've ever seen is going to give you a hundred percent of everything you need to know to be effective Mm -hmm. in sales. So you always need to be learning something and you have to take the initiative to also see yourself as a sales professional and move towards being a sales professional and do the things that a professional would do, which Mm -hmm. is diagnose and then prescribe, prescribed, prescribed, and then yeah. move people forward, right? Like there's one thing I learned a long time ago and I put in the book is, uh, you know, prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. Mm. Prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. So if, yeah. if you walk into a doctor's office and, and you say, hey, my foot hurts and the doctor's like, cool, I got these pills for you. Good luck with that. Like they are in a lot of trouble if they're wrong. Yeah, They might be yeah. right but they're probably going to be wrong if they just listen to you or, you know, mm-hmm. Hey, I, I looked up on WebMD and I have a tumor. <laughs> what can I do for that? Oh, okay, cool. Here, take this. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's malpractice, but they are under an oath, right? They have gone through a lot of testing. They're held to a very high standard. Salespeople are not. And so it's acting like a professional, like a doctor would. And here's the thing with doctors. And again, everybody listening to this, I, I can make the assumption that nobody's really selling life and death right? Mm-hmm. So a doctor comparison versus, you know, selling SaaS. Software sales, Obviously, yep. It, it, it's, it's, it's a little different, right? I've sold a lot of things in my life. I've never been involved with life and death decisions in sales. So I get it. Um, despite what a manager may feel or the quota may feel like, or the end of the quarter push may feel like life or death. Um, right. But here's the thing, like if you went to a doctor 
and they did their exam and they put all put you through all the tests and they come back with the diagnosis and they say based on this you have a tumor and the here's what we should do to take care of it um and here's my card and here's a brochure on tumors um and uh, i'll follow up with you next week let me know if you have any questions and uh and we'll you know we'll go from there i'm sure you have things that you need to research and look i'll send you some links uh and then let's just chat next week and see what happens right like that's not how they would do that they would say right. you have this issue uh the next step is we need to get it taken care of uh any mm -hmm. questions before we get you scheduled okay hold on i'm gonna get things set up right now right? They're very assumptive because they're yeah. a professional and they mm -hmm. did the diagnosis. They did the prescription. They know what the issue is and they can help. And they just assume that you want the help. As a salesperson, if you can take that same perspective, which is, I asked you questions. I figured out that you have a problem I can solve or a goal that I can help you achieve. And I have the solution. Then you assume the path, you're pulling them as the guide instead mm -hmm. of trying to push them into something. And I do a lot of training around that. I do a, a lot more about that, helping both the mindset and the strategy. But that's the huge thing is just viewing yourself as a professional and the kind of things a professional would do, not just a salesperson would do. So good. Tell us uh, maybe maybe a couple of transformation stories that you've seen, either from individual reps or from clients you've worked with. Uh, if you have any off the top of your head that you care to share, I'd, I'd love to hear um, whatever you can share. I know that you may not be able to, to, to go into super specifics around clients, uh, but any stories you have for big transformation that you've seen in your work? Yeah, I think the first one that comes to mind is on a personal level. So my client had a SaaS platform that helped companies generate more referrals. And so it wasn't to like feed them referrals. It was for them to use to get more referrals from their own clients and turn that into more referrals of clients. And yeah. one of the biggest transformations was the, the people on the team were acting more like order takers. Like we have this great platform. Hopefully you can buy it. You should use it. It's great but not really understanding more. And this is where I mentioned this earlier, but one of the biggest things that helped them transform was understanding the effect of buying or not buying from them and what that meant to the end user, to that company. And a lot of times, again, salespeople don't fully extrapolate and go all the way with what could happen, whether somebody buys or doesn't buy. Um, and obviously you're helping people, they were helping people get more referrals, which means more business, which means more revenue. If you don't have enough revenue, you go out of business. When I first right. started working with them, I was helping them understand this. And then they did an email blast to everyone who hadn't bought before. And out of like, I don't know, I think they sent like 400 emails, 85 of them bounced back. And not just like individuals, but like four people from a company, all of them would bounce and we looked oh, it up. Man. It wasn't that they changed their website. It was that they went out of business. Now, the point I drove home to them was, imagine if they had more referrals. Imagine if they had bought and you had successfully helped them and they generated more referrals, which are easier to close, and they made more money, then they wouldn't have gone out of business. But they went out of business. So they all lost oh, their jobs. Man. And then they have all these issues. And then who knows what happened? And you know, most divorces are because of financial issues. Like just mm -hmm. extrapolate the results of not selling somebody. And again, not to do fear mongering, but to like right. take it serious. And that was a huge shift for them because they're like, yeah, this is more than just selling a SaaS platform to help with referrals. Like this is to help their business, right? This is to make an impact and literally change the trajectory of that company. Um, and that's just a game changer, right? Like that's a totally different wow. approach. So uh, that one's huge because it seems silly. Like a lot of people are like, well, I'm just selling X, Y, Z, but what does that really mean to that other person? Because it means something. Um, so that, one's, that one is, yeah. it always makes me realize that point. A lot of people in sales just get desensitized. They forget the other person is, is a person. A and human, yeah. What it really means. They're human. And the company is a company full of humans. And so they forget that. Um, the other big one is I worked with a company where we basically, I went in and part of it was to analyze and look at who on the team could do it, what was missing. A lot of the transformation that took place in there was with the leadership. Again, 
the managers and supervisors had been salespeople who got promoted and they assumed that because they were good in sales, they should be good at leading and they weren't. They didn't have the tools, right? They kind of knew how to jump in and close deals, but they literally didn't know how to run or coach or lead a team of people. And so a lot of the clients, like them in particular that I work with, I can do some training for the salespeople. I'll give you some tactics. Uh, but if yeah. the management structure isn't very effective from managers to branch managers, direct to directors, to VP of sales, like if that stuff isn't in place, it's just a house built on sand. You're just going to keep a high level of turnover if your managers aren't, and nobody's going to want to yeah. become a manager because they see how crappy that job is because no one's <laughs> right. doing it right because no one's getting the training. And so that's a huge one too, is, is, is like this one company was actually offshore and they brought me in and literally working mostly with the managers. And then they, after I left, could then just perpetuate those strategies, you know, long-term. Yeah, that's so true. I've seen that story play out too many times with the, the top rep goes into the, the manager or the VP spot and has no basis for what that job entails. And the, the playbook can't necessarily be replicated across 10, 20, 30, 50 reps. Uh, they may have had some special gift or insight or quality that allowed them to be the top performer, but it doesn't necessarily translate to scaling a whole team. So that is really frustrating. Yeah, it's really challenging. And then when somebody goes from like a team leader, a supervisor, whatever that equivalent role might be, where you're, you're, you're responsible for helping a group of people, but also a contributor to then when mm -hmm. you're like a non-contributing manager or leader, like that's a huge different step. And then how do you deal with the fact that your company wants to put you in some kind of email hell and meeting <laughs> hell when you're supposed to be leading the troops on the front lines, but the yeah. company doesn't, I, I work a lot with a lot of upper level leaders, CEOs, owners, even VP of sales who have forgotten that the role of their frontline managers or the managers closest to it, they need to be helping the team be right. effective, not looking at their email, filling out reports, being dashboards. Good cop and bad cop yeah. dashboards, like all this stuff, like mm -hmm. some portion, but not, not perpetually um, because they're just at that point, they're just letting the troops do whatever the troops want to do. And uh, that's not how you win anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of your thoughts that I want to get, and I, I brought this up before we started recording. So I see that you do a lot of work with contact centers, call centers. Uh, that's uh, an area of business that's near and dear to me. I started my career in a, in a call center, and I currently, for my day job, work with contact center and call center leaders. Uh, so I'm curious what insights and ideas you have for any of the contact center leaders out there that might tune into this. How? So one of the things that I hear from a lot of my contacts in that you know, that are in that leadership spot is, you know, we are getting from, from the top down, we're, we're being encouraged to try to turn this from a cost center into a profit center. And in a lot of cases, they've never done any sort of cross selling or upselling, or there's not been a sales culture in a call center. It's been more of a service and support culture. And they're now having to figure out ways that they can promote products over the phone to customers who are calling in maybe for support issues or maybe they are calling in to, to make purchases. But I'm curious, just your thoughts, where you see that industry going. I think it's really exciting because customer experience is such a, it's come a long way just in the last couple of years. And then with the pandemic, certain things have accelerated. More, more of this interaction is going digital. Um, but I just love any thoughts or insights you have on the direction that the call center is going uh, and how, you know, kind of the, the core question is, how can they transform from a, a cost center to a profit center? What are some ways that, that leaders can think about that? Yeah, I think, um, I think one of the biggest things to keep in mind and to focus on is what's in the best interest for the customer, mm -hmm. for them in the short term and long term. Right. Because when I hear you describing that, I can picture a couple of companies that wanted to make that transition. And it was purely bottom line driven, like again, yeah. cost center to revenue center. And it's just for the sake of the numbers. And that, again, I use this word a lot because a lot of people can relate as a customer that will then feel gross. Right. right. When, when, when you go to buy a TV and you're trying to walk out of that electronic store and check out and they keep hammering you with the extended warranty and hammering, it feels gross. Like they're trying, like you can tell that person has a bonus and incentive, mm -hmm. like something I've even had people say like, 
you know, if, if I need, I need three people to sign up today, will you sign up for this? Like that kind of stuff. It's like, no, that's, that's <laughs> like, I get right? that a and lot from, not- I was going to say, I get that a lot from like banks when you, whenever you, you might be banks. calling in because you lost your debit card and you're, you know, you maybe put on hold for a while. And then when someone comes back while you're waiting for them to process the order for your new card, it's how come you're not applying for a second mortgage <laughs> or whatever it is. And you do hear that. Like I've, I've got to hit three or five of these a day uh, in order to keep my teller job here, my, you know, phone right. teller job here, which is really, really shitty, frankly. <laughs> And I, and I was at a nationwide uh, clothing store that uh, literally I was checking, I was like a month ago and I was checking out and they're like, do you want to sign up for a credit card? I'm like, no, he's like, yeah, I need to get like two more today or, you know, I'm not going to hit my numbers. I'm like, I don't care. I'm not getting a new credit card. I literally don't give a shit what your numbers are. <laughs> and, and that's where the customer experience is bad. That's where people get upset. That's where sales feels gross is when it feels like the incentive is for the company and the metrics and the KPIs and not the customer, right? Like, right. I don't care if you're going to, if I'm going to save 30, 30% on my purchase today by signing up for your credit card, like that may not matter to me. Like that's yeah. not, that might not be worth it. But again, that's about you company, not me customer. And so I think that's the biggest first thing. If you want to be successful in, in having upsell, cross sell and doing all that, it has to be in service of the mm-hmm. customer, the customer experience and them looking at it honestly, at the long-term lifetime value of that customer. Is this going to turn them off? Are we, are we dropping dollars to pick up pennies, mm-hmm. right? Because we want to get someone sold today, but then they might get upset and not you know, be with us long-term? Or does this actually help them? Like your bank experience, right? So uh, you know, why don't you have a second? Like, if you want to know, let's talk about it. Ask me some questions. Then if you have a good solution, I'm all ears, but it's got to be a solution for me, not for you. And I think mm-hmm. that's the huge thing. I think with organizations that have a sales component, so there's a sales team and a sales department, somebody is selling something. And then now we're getting to the customer experience on the back end, customer service, support, those things. One of the best ways, if you want to turn that cost center into a profit center and revenue center that I have found is to have sales take lots of notes and document the whole thing about that buyer. Even again, I've dealt with a lot of business to consumer shorter sales cycles. You can still save notes. Now here's the challenge. Salespeople don't like to make notes, just like they don't like to use scripts because that's not why they got into sales. They got into sales to schmooze and do their thing and talk people into stuff, talk, right? Yep. That's it. But the problem is from a business perspective, the gold that your salespeople will uncover that they could put into the notes that then when that person calls in, right? And I see this a lot with SaaS, which is, you know, their account manager is now building, they're extending the relationship with them and looking through the notes and then, you know, helping them on board and they're going through everything. And they're like, Hey, by the way, I see this other thing. If, if this goes well, have you thought about this? Like, I really think that could be helpful. And it's an extension. It's just building more and more value. I think that's huge. Cause here's the yeah. thing that most people forget. And it's so important is your buyer is scared. I mentioned mm-hmm. it earlier. Your job is to make them feel safe. There is a very good chance that somebody will sign up for one thing from your company, even though they think and you know they could sign up for five things from your company, right? Like your mm. bank experience, right? You yeah. sign up for a checking account because you need a checking account, but I also don't trust you. And I don't want a second mortgage or a line of credit or open up a CD. <laughs> and it's weird. Why are you selling yeah. me all this stuff? Like, I don't want to. I barely trust you enough on this first date. Let's just go do this first thing and see how this goes, right? Yeah. Um, but they know, like, yeah, I think those things would be helpful, but I don't know you well enough yet, right? And so then in your follow-up, the customer experience where you could upsell and cross-sell, then hopefully their guard has gone down. You've built trust and a relationship. Whatever you said you were going to do, you did it. And now you can talk to them about those things and you have to treat them in stages um, and not be too pushy. Solid gold, man. I love it. So uh, I know we're, we're coming up here on time. How, how can my listeners get in touch with you? Where can we find your book? What's the best way to engage in a, in a conversation with you? Well, I think a, a couple of things. So sure. if you're in sales, 
best thing you can do is I have an ebook. It's available on Amazon, but if you email me, I'm happy to send anybody the PDF. I just want to get this out there. Uh, it's titled the sales consultants guide to overcoming objections. Um, cool. which is so key. It's a lot of stuff we've been talking about, but then it yeah. gives you some actual strategies for overcoming objections. Um, so you can email me, jason at cutterconsultinggroup.com. Um, so if you're in sales, that's a great one. Or if you're a leader and you want to share it with a team, if you're a manager or a leader, I have one called motivating your team to help them win. Uh, email me, jason at cutterconsultinggroup.com. I'm happy to share those just to help anybody just you know, become more effective. No strings attached, not going to do any sales pitch, just email me. I, awesome. That's why I wrote those. This is just to get those things out there. Um, and then everything else, I've made it easy. If people want to go to jasoncutter.com, I've made that a hub for everything. So if you want to find, I currently have three podcasts. If you want to find my podcasts, uh, the one we talked about and the other ones, I have two podcasts that are focused on call centers. Uh, plus the Authentic Persuasion Show. You can find a link for buying the book directly, uh, hiring me to speak, training, consulting, all that. So jasoncutter.com keeps that nice and simple. Awesome. I will post links to your email and your website. Definitely reach out, get in touch. Jason, thank you so much, man. I learned a ton uh, and I'm probably going to go refine my script right now. <laughs> And uh, I think we should probably keep you as a recurring guest on the show just because this was so interesting. Um, so thank you. Thank you for, for coming on and, and sharing some wisdom with the audience. Well, and I appreciate you for having this show and wanting to spread these things. And the more that you know, people like you and I in this community can do to help others just will change the way people sell, which will change the way people view sales, which is why I love coming on shows like this and, and your questions. And, you know, if, even if it just helps you with your scripting a little bit, then, mm -hmm. uh, you know, then, then this was awesome. Yeah.